The Word Made Flesh by George Carey and Ines Eudora Perry. God, man, the Word Made Flesh. Just going to read another excerpt from a very powerful, very interesting book. Pagan, and I would even say hermetic in its roots. Alchemical for sure. It's a philosophy of etymology, how words encode meaning, and how those ancient meanings our ancestors knew. And with the advent of uh, Rome, all this changed. Uh, if you've seen my, some of my videos, you've seen how the calendar was changed, the year was changed, the names of the, the gods, the Osir, were changed. And the languages were changed. And of course, when you forbid someone from using their, their own native language, you get to rewrite their history. You get to change the meanings of their words. It's an old teaching. And if you're, if you're looking into the esoteric, side of theology, philosophy, and uh, wordsmithing. This book is second to none. Especially if you have a Western, uh, if you come from the West, if you come from a, an Abrahamic background, a Christian, Muslim, or Judaic background. This will definitely shine some light on things if you're ready for it and if you're open to it. So here we go. The Word Made Flesh by George Carey. Just going to read a chapter or two. Primitive Christians, the Essenes, fully realized and taught the great truth that Christ was a substance, an oil, or an ointment, contained especially in the spinal cord, consequently in all parts of the body, as every nerve in the body is directly or indirectly connected with the wonderful river that flows out of Eden, the upper brain, to water the garden. The early Christians knew that scriptures, whether written in Hebrew or Greek, were allegories, parables, or fables based on the human body, fearfully and wonderfully made. All right, I'm going to pause every now and then and throw my two cents in. When you get past the monotheistic slash Abrahamic, I'll call them religions, you get into the world of the old shamans and the old Druids, the old Brehan, the old Bards, and the old Pagans. And I mean from all over the world, not just the Northern European ones. And they all knew that the sacred balance in the universe was that of male and female energies, light and dark, up and down, hot and cold, magnetic, electric, yin and yang. And that sacred union is how a child or the next life comes into being. And that is a, a cycle, a circle. And without it, we all perish. So they also knew that in their ancient pagan roots, in their words, in their sounds, and in their alphabets, and in their symbols, they knew that the salvation, so to speak, of every human is only found individually within. And that initiation was a self-induced process. And that everything we need is just like a seed. The old hermetic teaching is already within us. How does a tiny acorn know its expression as a full, magnificent oak tree? Yeah, it's in there. It's in there from the moment the seed is created. Given all the correct conditions, it will grow to express that beauty of the the ancient tree of life. So, what George Carey is telling you is what we all used to know, is that everything that we think of as religious today under the Vaticanized Roman Empire is a subversion of the truth, not the truth. And um, I'm not reading this to piss anybody off. If you're a Christian, this is not to, to discredit your, your way. It actually will enhance it if you're open to understanding the roots 
of where it all began. Uh, but you have to be open to that and, and even ready. So it's, it's all trapped in the words. I, I know I'm kind of going on here, but it's all trapped in the words. So you have to understand the etymology of these words, what they mean. So Christos in Greek is oil, a sacred oil. Okay, here we go. These adepts knew that the secretion, the gray matter, the gray creative, which issues or secretes from the cerebrum was the source and cause of the physical expression called man. And they knew that the river of Jordan was symbolized in the spinal cord and that the Dead Sea was used to symbolize the sacred plexus at the base of the spinal column where the Jordan, the spinal cord ends, typifying the entrance of Jordan into the Dead Sea. The thick, oily, and salty substance composed the sacral plexus, the coata equina, which means the horse's tail in Latin, which is our, basically that's our, our tail, our, all the nerves that run through our sex organs from our sacrum, from our lower spine. It looks like fine hairs of a horse's tail, so they called it the coata equina. The horse's tail may be likened to a crude petroleum, petra, mineral or salt, and oleum, Latin for oil. And the thinner substance, oil or ointment in the spinal cord, may be compared with coal oil. And when this oil is carried up to the crosses of the ida and pingala, the two fluid nerves that end in a cross in the medulla oblongata, where it contacts the cerebellum, Golgotha, the place of the skull. This fluid is refined as coal oil is refined to produce gasoline, a higher rate of motion that causes the ascension of the airship. Okay, so what very few people know is that the Bible itself, the bibliography, is, is two things. It's a genealogy, a family lineage, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and so on. But the book itself and all the characters in it actually refer to the temple of God, which is the human body itself. I know people find this hard to believe, but there are all these clues. Like, for example, the, the mountain known as Golgotha in the biblical story. Well, Golgotha literally means the place of the skull. So most people think it's a real mountain sitting somewhere in the Levant. But it was never meant to be a real mountain. That's what Rome did. They rewrote the history. Golgotha is actually your skull, every human being's skull, because that's this place where the crucifixion takes place. It's all inside of us. When the oil or ointment is crucified, to crucify means to increase in power a thousandfold, not to kill. It remains two days and a half, the moon's period in the sign of the tomb the cerebellum on the third day ascends to the pineal gland that connects to the cerebellum. Connects to the cerebellum with the optic thalamus, the central eye in the throne of God, is the chamber overtopped by hollow or hallowed, caused by the curve of the cerebrum, the most high of the body, which is the temple of the living God, the living vital substance, which is precipitation of the breath of life, breathed into man, therefore the holy or whole, ghost of breath. So what's being explained here, it's a little cryptic, the language, but what's being explained here is the sacred secret or secretion. That's what that word means, secret secretion that comes from, from the pituitary and the pineal gland. That chemistry comes out of the brain, goes down the spinal column, column all the way to the sex organs in order to make new life. It's charged with electric soul power. But that, that force also, if not used to make life and not expelled or wasted, it changes its chemistry once it, once it mixes together. That's the chemical wedding that the alchemists talk about. Once that new substance happens, it becomes less dense and it floats back up the, the spinal column in the cerebral spinal fl fluid, like mercury does in a thermometer. And it rests 
in the nave in the gland known as the solar plexus. And it charges itself there uh, based on the way you live. And it, it the, the way you treat your body, the way you eat and drink and sleep and exercise. And it rests there for two and a half days. Now that two and a half days is significant because it's it's the the uh, the time each month that the moon is in the sign in which you were born under your sun sign. So whatever month you're born under, you know, January, February, March, that's the month. That's your sun sign. And the moon goes every 30 days, actually every 28 days or sometimes 29 just like the female cycle, it goes through each stage in the sky of the, the sun sign. So every month, every person has two and a half days where the moon is in their sun sign. And that particular moment, that type of light is a cycle that started at your birth. And your body knows when that is. You might not know, but your subconscious body knows. And it takes an electrical charge from a combination of the sun and the moon's uh, electromagnetic energy and charges this up while it's in your solar plexus. That's why it's called your solar plexus. Ever wonder that? Interesting how every doctor around the world, no matter what culture you come from, points to this weird spot where your rib cage comes together in the center of your body and they say, oh yeah, that's the solar plexus. But no one ever asks why it's called that. What does it have to do with the sun? Well, I, I, I just told you. That's why it's called the solar plexus. It's a, it's a very specific glandular spot. Anyway, George Carey will go on and point this out. The pineal gland is the pinnacle of the temple, the modus operandi, in which the oil of the spinal cord reaches the pineal gland and is described in what follows. There is no name under heaven whereby ye may be saved except Jesus Christ did, or christened, and then crucified. The correct rendering of the text in Greek. Every 29 and a half days when the moon is in the sign of the zodiac that the sun was in at the birth of the native, there is a seed, a psychophysical germ, born in the or out of the solar plexus also known as the manger. And this seed is taken up by the nerves or branches of the pneumogastric nerve and becomes the fruit of the tree of life or the tree of good and evil. Good, if saved and cast upon the waters, circulation to reach the pineal gland. And it's known as evil, if eaten or consumed in sexual expression on the physical plane or by alcoholic drinks or gluttony, it causes fermentation or acid, and even alcohol in the intestinal tract. Thus, in quotes, no drunkard can inherit the kingdom of heaven. For acids and alcohol cut or chemically split the oil that unites with the mineral salts in the body and thus produces the monthly seed. So that's what he's saying, is that this oil is mm, it's special because it's electrically charged. And it also is special because it has the ability to make new life and your body created it. But it's also very, um, what is it? It's fragile based on the way you treat your body. So the idea was, is to take care of it and to know that it's traveling up and down your spine and transmutate your sex energy accordingly. Now he's not talking about celibacy. He's talking about knowing the body and using that energy at the right time for the right things. Going on, the seed having the odor of fish was called Jesus or ictus, which is Greek for fish, and nun, N-U-N, Hebrew for of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So many of us have seen the fish being associated with Jesus. Ictos means fish in Greek. And also you've probably seen that sticker on the back of everybody's car that has either Jesus written in it and it's the shape of a fish 
or it has the Greek word Iesos, Iesos, uh, which is the same thing. It's Jesus in Greek because the letter J is new. The letter J was a 16th century invention. So when Jesus was walking around, there was no J, and he would not have you know, written his name with a J. It would have been a Y in Hebrew. It would have been an I in Greek. The fruit of the tree of life, therefore, is the fish, bread, of which thou shalt not eat on the plain or animal of Adam, earth dust of the earth plain. Adam, the word Adam often in, in Hebrew text means red earth or earth, earth dust. But to him that overcometh will I give to eat the fruit of the tree of life, because he saved it, and it returned to him in the cerebellum and the home of the spiritual man, the ego. The cerebellum is the heart-shaped, and it is called the heart in Greek. Thus, in quotes, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, another little thing, another side. The, the tree of knowledge, or the tree of life, whatever you want to call it, is not a physical place. It's never been a physical place. That was the invention of Rome to pull people away from the real place of salvation, which is your own body, the human form. And the tree of life is your cerebrospinal tree, your cerebrospinal system. Your brain is the root ball, and all your nerves branch out, going down your body like a tree. You know, we are like a walking inverted tree. That is the original tree of life. The body organ that men in their ignorance call heart is termed divider or pump in Greek and Hebrew. Our blood divider is not the button that we touch when we think, but it is the upper lobe of the cerebellum that vibrates thought. The lower lobe is the animal or mortal lobe that governs the animal world, the section of the body below the solar plexus called lower Egypt, natural body, kingdom of earth, Apollyon, the devil lived spelled backwards, Satan. Saturn governs the bowels. Okay, I know there's a lot there, but again, you have to know the etymology. The word devil, D-E-V-I-L, is just lived spelled backwards. So that was also a subversion that, was, that happened when the clergy knew how to write and nobody else did. They subverted the word lived, reversed it, and made the devil. Now, what they're really talking about was what we all used to know is the animal parts of our body, the part that we um, abuse or, or we, don't, we don't hold sacred, meaning our sex organs. And that's also, I know this is a touchy subject, but that's also why the word Sodom refers to your lower, you know, your lower excretory organs. And that's what Sodom and Gomorrah was all about. Even it was not, it was never a real place. Sodom and Gomorrah is not a, a city or a place on earth. It's a place in your bowels, the bowels of hell, so to speak. But that word's been subverted too. Hell. Hell was not a negative thing. That's why we say hello. That's why we say halo, helling, valhalla, or hell. It was all, it was originally a good thing. It was a good place. But again, Rome subverted that word. During the first 300 years of the Christian era, all has been above written was understood by the real Christians, and about the end of time, the persecution of the Essenes by the priesthood came so marked that they met in secret and always made the sign of the fish. About the year 325, Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor, called the teachers of Christianity together at Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea. Constantine murdered his mother and boiled his wife in oil because they still held the original doctrines of the Essenes. Constantine was told by the priests of his time that there was no forgiveness for crimes such as his except through a long series of incarnations. But the Antichrist sought to concoct a plan by which he hoped to cheat the cosmic law. And so it came to pass, after months of wrangling and fighting over the writings of the primitive Christians who clothed the wonders of the human body in oriental imaginary imagery that the council sometimes by a bare majority voted and decided which of the manuscripts were 
quote unquote, the word of God, and which were not. So we all know that the Council of Nicaea was where the Bible was canonized, edited, uh, huge parts of it were taken out and other parts were written in, which is, which is pretty obvious to see. Um, you know, there were supposedly 12 disciples, but there's only four accounts of them in the Bible, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, where's the other eight? Well, they were all there, but they were conveniently edited out for all kinds of political reasons. The very important point in the minds of those ignorant priests, whether or not an angel had wings, was decided in favor of wings by the three majority. The minority contended that as Jacob let down the ladder for the angels to descend and ascend upon, it was a prima facie, evidence that the angels do not have wings. Okay, what he's talking about there in that paragraph is that Jacob's ladder was not a real event that some man named Jacob witnessed. Jacob's ladder was a story, an allegory that talked about, that talked about the spine, the ladder that angels went up and down are the 33 vertebrae of the spine. And angels are angles, angles of light. They're also called messengers in Hebrew, the El, the Elohim. But really those messengers, what they really refer to is the newborn child, the innocence of new humanity. The point is, is that Jacob's ladder is not, it's not a story of a man named Jacob. This is, I mean, obviously everyone, well, I don't wanna say everyone, but when you read multiple spiritual traditions from all over the world from different sacred texts, you can't help but realize that they're always talking in metaphor or parable or allegory. So the Bible should be no different. And there are certain people that want to take it literally, but you're talking about something spiritual. And so the only way to get at something abstract is to put it in some sort of language, some sort of story, or some sort of way to referen reference the context of it. So spiritual texts are almost always referring to some sort of metaphor. Just think for a moment upon the colossal ignorance of these priests who did not know that Jacob in Hebrew means heel catcher or circle, the latter that referred to the influence of the signs of the zodiac upon the earth. And as one sign rising every two hours forms a circle every 24 hours, the four and 20 elders of Revelation, the outer stars and the rising suns, suns, S-U-N, rising suns, and suns, S-O-N-S. Catching on, he asks, to the last suns of the sign ascending. So, okay, he's saying that the word Jacob means heel catcher, and, and it, it does in reference to the sky or the zodiac. It's still, see, he's, say, he's not saying Jacob's ladder. He's saying the word, the name Jacob. So there's two meanings. There is the ladder, which, like I said before, is the human spine in which the prodigal son of the sacred oil or Christos travels up and down to offer healing and enlightenment to the human form. And then there's also the heel catcher, the word, the name Jacob. And in very ancient zodiacs, you'll see a man drawn in the center of them where his heels, his back is arched and his heels circle around and touch the back of his head to create a circle. And that's what the word Jacob means. That's the name, it's the man in the sky, which refers to the zodiac, which is a reflection of the time cycle of the human body. But now we come to the Antichrist. The Council of Nicaea, dominated by Constantine, voted that these symbols of the human body were persons, that Jesus was a certain historical man, a contention utterly and indubitably without foundation, in fact, and that all who believed the story would be saved and forgiven here and now. The idea appealed to the Constantine as an easy way out of his troubled mind, and so the scheme of salvation by the actual blood of a real man or God was engrafted in the world. Constantine and his dupes saw that the only way to perpetuate the infamy was to keep the world in ignorance of the operation of the cosmic law, so they changed quote-unquote, times and seasons. So that's what I'm saying. 
the invention of the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar, uh, there's other Roman calendars. They slowly changed the, the beginning of the year. They slowly changed some of the names of the months. They slowly changed the amount of days in a month. That's why we have leap years now. And so there's other videos I've made about this where if you look at, the, again, it's trapped in the words. If you look at the words, the etymology, you know, for example, the word March is not the third month of the year because the spring equinox happens March 20th every year. And March in Latin literally means primo. Primo means first. So March is telling you it's the first month of the year. And you can go all the way around the year and go down to, well, look at December. Most people think December is the last month of the year, the 12th month. But in Latin, the word dece or deca, December, deca, means 10. So a decade rounds out a 10-year period. So December or deca means 10. Decimal is 1 through 9 with a zero, that point starts things over. So December is not the 12th month of the year. It's the 10th month of the year. And, uh, you know, oct for October, oct means eight, like an octagon. But October in the current calendar is the 10th month of the year. But the word itself will tell you October is not the 10th month of the year. It's the eighth month of the year. So like I said, it's right in there. It's right in the words. And when you know, when you really look into etymology, you start to see it. Also, the esoteric structure of the alphabets itself, the symbols that make up the words, it gets even more complex and deeper and deeper. But as you can see, the Council of Nicaea changed things. And they've kept us in the dark ever since. And it was because they controlled all the writing. There were very few people that were literate, except the clergy, so... They had a lot of power to rewrite history, to change the meanings of words, and also to change time cycles. The date that they made the sun enter Aries was March 21st. Why? March 21st should be the first day of Aries, the head. Aries means to arise. April 19th should be the first day of Taurus, the neck. And when, he, when they're talking about the head and the neck, they're talking about that man, Jacob, the heel catcher, the body in the sky. So each month correlates to a part of the human body. So Aries is the head, Taurus is the neck, and, and so on and so forth. It goes all the way down the body each month. On through the 12 signs. But these deciding schemers knew that by thus suppressing the truth, the people might come to realize what was meant by, and in quotes, the heavens declare the glory of God. Again, the moon in its monthly, moon, mon, Monday, all come from the same word. So every moon is a month. The moon in its monthly round of 29 and a half days enters the outer stars of a constellation two and a half days before it enters the central suns of the constellations that are known as the signs of the zodiac or the circle of beasts. But even unto this day, the whole Antichrist world so-called Christian, except the astrologers, go by almanacs that make the moon enter a sign of the zodiac two and a half days before it does enter it, and thus perpetuate the lie of the pagan Constantine, the Antichrist. Okay, so there you have one small chapter of the book, The Word Made Flesh by George Carey. I highly recommend looking at his work. Reading this book is amazing, especially if you have any kind of interest in, um, in the Bible or Christianity, or even Judaic history, it will definitely shed some light. It also deals a lot with the human body and its magnificence. Now, George Carey also has a, another book. I think it's called The Tree of Life. It's, it's something about the tree. I have it. I've read it. I think I've even read excerpts of it somewhere on my channel, but I, I'm not positive of the name, but I think it's just called The Tree of Life. It's a short book, but it's also very good at explaining how these ancient words really refer to the human body where all experience happens, whether it's experience of God or experience of self or experience of nature and others. It's all going to happen behind your eyes within you. So that is the temple. 
The human body is the temple of God. And again, the ancients all knew this, and our rituals were in accordance with the sacredness of the human body, both male and female. All right, comment below, please share. Hope you enjoy it, and um, check out George Carey's work.